All right, good morning, everybody. Thank you all for joining us. I want to thank the senators who are here today. We've got a number of things on the plate, so we're going to go ahead and just jump right in. Uh, first of all, we're going to be uh, talking about some of the early successes in the legislative session with regard to bills. We've got a couple of bill signings here. The first one is uh, LB 389. Now, one of the things that we have done here in the state of Nebraska is really focused on making Nebraska one of the most veteran and military friendly states in the country. On March 29th, I proclaimed it to be Vietnam War Veterans Day to help recognize the sacrifices the men and women who fought in the Vietnam War did. And of course, over the course of the last six years, we've taken a number of steps to help out active duty spouses as well as veterans. Uh, we've expanded hiring preferences for active duty spouses. We've passed legislation to make it easier to get permits or licenses uh, for uh, spouses of active duty military and things such as realtors or nurses. And uh, we've also passed, of course, significantly the Veterans Tax Relief Package from last year, which uh, Senator Brewer, thank you very much for that. That was awesome. Uh, and then Senator Gregor is sponsoring uh, the second half of that this year. So we're very, we're very pleased uh, to be able to do that. And uh, so the, f uh, the, another step that we have here is to continue to make it easier for the spouses of military, active duty military, to come to Nebraska and integrate into our communities. So what we've previously done with regard to this is we had passed a regulation or signed a regulation to grant temporary teaching licenses. But with LB 389, which was um, uh, introduced by Senator Sanders and then co-sponsored with um, by Senator Blood, I believe you were the first uh, co-sponsor, is that right, Senator Blood? Yep. And then, but also co-sponsored by Senator Gregert, Senator Brewer, and Senator Merman uh, to be able to make that a statute, make it permanent. and. Uh, let anybody who has a teaching license is in good standing when the states are coming from, and it's still in good standing, so if you've been teaching for at least a year and you've got that teaching certificate and you're in good standing in the states you've been teaching, you can come to Nebraska and get a, a three-year teaching per, uh, license permit. And that will also require the Department of Education to expedite getting that done. So we're very pleased to have that. And so what I'd like to do is, we're, because we're going to do a little bit of social distancing here, what I'm going to do is have, uh, I'm going to go ahead and sign this, and then Senator Sanders, I'm going to ask you to come up and say a few words, and then Senators, I'm going to sign some of the other copies for you and ask you to come up, and we'll do a, a, a photo op here, and then we'll let you all get back to the floor on uh, this bill, because uh, we know that, you got, that you're got you all still in session and working and everything. But before we do that, let me go ahead and sign this. All right, so this is our LB. Oh, by the way, this bill passed unanimously, too, so congratulations to all the senators. So we are officially signed here. Senator Sanders, please come up. I've had my shots. Yeah, you're good. <laughs> First of all, I want to thank Governor Ricketts for bringing me this bill. Governor, it's been a pleasure working with you and your staff. I also want to thank Senators Blood, Brewer, Gregert, Merman for sponsoring this legislation. LB 389 will have a tremendous impact. Schools in the Bellevue metro area can now fill their many openings with more qualified teachers. Military spouses moving into our state will get into jobs much faster. Nebraska continues to be the most welcoming state for members of our armed forces and by completing the DOD's military checklist spouse licensure, LB 389 shows Washington, D.C. that Offutt, Bellevue, and Nebraska are the best places for missions. This is my first bill as a state senator to be signed into law, and I think that it's fitting considering Offutt's an annual impact of $2.7 billion. When we support Offutt and the men and women we support our economy, our citizens, and our state. Thanks again to Governor Ricketts. I am thrilled to see LB 389 pass the finish line. Thank you. All right, Thank so Senator Stairs, uh, actually, will you stay up here for a moment? Mm -hmm. And actually, I, I like to call, let's see, make sure we got the right one here again. 
Can I call the other senators to come on up? Senator Blood, Merman, Gregert, and Brewer. And I will present the ceremonial copies to you as well. Thank you. All right. Senator Sanders, congratulations. Thank you very much. Wait, That's for you. Photos. All right, right. <laughs> Wait. Let's do this. I've had my shots, full disclosure. It's less than 15 minutes, it's fine. <laughs> Thank you. Great. All right. So our blood, we're going to do you next. Ladies first, gentlemen, I can't believe that you're like getting in her way. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Congratulations. Thank you. All right, great. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, Senator Merman, you're next up. Congratulations. Oops, hold on a second. Let me get an extra copy there. Let me put that down. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, Senator Gregert. Congratulations. Thank you, sir. All right, great. And last but certainly not least, Senator Brewer. Thank you for all that you do for our veterans, and thank you for what you do for our country. Thank you, sir. Great. Thank you very much. Let's give a round of applause. Good job, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Go vote now. Huh? Let's go vote. Go vote. All right. Next, we'll move on to LB 297. So one of the things that we have seen is that criminals across America have been targeting our seniors. And last year, we took a step forward in protecting our older Nebraskans with the passage of a bill that allowed banks to be able to intercede when they believed that a senior was being taken advantage of. Uh, it applied to uh, checking accounts and savings accounts and so forth. Uh, but uh, this year, Senator Lindstrom, who works in the investment advisory industry, uh, brought a bill that would expand what the work we did last year to protect uh, older Nebraskans to be able to allow folks in his industry to be able to do the same thing with regard to their investments. So, for example, now investment advisors will be able to delay a transaction for up to 30 days if they suspect that one of our older Nebraskans is being taken advantage of or a victim of fraud and so forth. So we're very pleased to have Senator Lindstrom here to talk about LB 297, as well as Kelly Lammers, who is the director for the Department of Banking, who has also work, worked on this bill to be able to bring it to the floor. And then uh, Gina Ragland, who's with the AARP, is here to talk about it as well. Uh, they were obviously very supportive of getting this bill done. And this bill also passed unanimously, so congratulations, Senator Lindstrom, on that. And so let me sign this, and then I will ask you to come up and say a few words. And then we'll let you go vote. All right. With my signature, we're officially signed on LB 297. And Senator Lindstrom, please come up and say a few words. Well, thank you, Governor, and I appreciate your support and was pleased to introduce LB 297 uh, the, to adopt the Nebraska Protection of Vulnerable Adults from Financial Exploitation Act. This bill was a companion to LB 853, introduced by Senator Matt Williams and passed during the 2020 legislative session. LB 297 focused the act to include securities industry participants, such as investment advisors and broker dealers. LB 297 would allow them to place a hold for up to 30 days on a transaction or distribution in cases of suspected financial exploitation and to notify a designated third party on behalf of the vulnerable adult or senior adult in the case of suspected financial exploitation. 
As a member of the investment industry, this legislation is vital to our clientele who depend on our trust and their advisors for their financial well-being. Ultimately, this legislation was brought forth to strengthen our state's protections for those who need it most, our senior citizens and vulnerable adult population. I am grateful to have worked with Director Lammers and his staff to pass invaluable legislation. Thank you to the legislature for the overwhelming approval of this measure and to Governor Ricketts for his signature here today. Thank you. And I'll introduce Director Lammers. Governor Ricketts. Thank you, Senator Lindstrom. My name is Kelly Lammers. I'm director of the Nebraska Department of Banking and Finance. It's my pleasure to be here today, witness the signing of the Nebraska Protection of Vulnerable Adults from Financial Exploitation Act. I want to thank Governor Ricketts, Senator Lindstrom, for their leadership in this important bill to protect consumers and prevent financial exploitation of seniors and vulnerable adults. Assets owned by Nebraska's growing senior population are a tempting target for unscrupulous individuals. The department has received and continues to receive reports from financial professionals concerned that their clients may be victims of financial exploitation. The department works with these customers to limit harm, investigate violations of our financial statutes and regulations, and makes referrals to appropriate agencies to investigate suspected exploitation. But our experience has shown that once the money has left the account, we can't get it back. Many times, we are simply trying to get people to stop throwing good money after bad. With governor's approval of LB 297 today, we joined 28 other states which have passed similar legislation for broker dealers and investment advisors. The act provides essential tools for broker dealers and investment advisors to encourage them to report suspected financial exploitation, notify third parties when appropriate, maintain and share records of the suspected financial exploitation, and to hold transactions and disbursements so that the agencies have an opportunity to investigate before assets leave the account. To the greatest extent possible, the act also works to preserve the ability of persons to make their own financial decisions. Protecting seniors and vulnerable adults from financial exploitation is a key priority for the department to make Nebraska the most trusted financial home for people and business. I greatly appreciate and admire the dedication of our department's teammates, as well as DHHS, Adult Protective Services, AARP, and law enforcement in protecting this vulnerable group. Finally, I want to thank our partners in the financial industry shared their experiences and expertise with us. When we receive their calls, we hear their concerns, we share their fears for their clients. With LB 297, we are able to give them the protections and tools they need to help their clients preserve their hard-earned assets from financial exploitation. Thank you. Uh, Gina Raglan from AARP. Thank you, Director Lammers. On behalf of AARP Nebraska and all Nebraskans 50 plus and their families, I wanna thank Governor Ricketts for the invitation to be here today and his support for this important legislation. I'd also like to extend a thank you and congratulations to Senator Brett Lindstrom for his work on this issue and his ongoing dedication in the legislature in assisting Nebraska seniors. Prevention of financial exploitation is critical to AARP's mission to empower people to choose how they live as they age. Everyone has the right to be safe from physical, emotional, or financial abuse, neglect or abandonment, confinement or intimidation. Nebraska is the 29th state to adopt the North American Securities Administrators Act. LB 297, the Nebraska Protection of Vulnerable Adults from Financial Exploitation Act, encourages and allows investment professionals to report to a state securities regulator and state adult protective services agency when reasonable belief in financial exploitation of an eligible adult has been attempted or has occurred. LB 297 unties the hands of investment firms to respond effectively to a suspected financial exploitation of customers. Older vulnerable adults lose billions of dollars to financial exploitation. Expanding reporting and critically allowing a temporary pause on transactions when there is a reasonable belief that financial exploitation is happening will effectively help prevent financial exploitation. Elder financial exploitation is a significant problem and it is expected to become worse as our population continues to age. Older Americans make up 12% of the population nationwide, but can constitute a full 30% of the victims of consumer fraud crime. 
Older Nebraskans are especially susceptible to financial exploitation because they often have sizable assets and a reliable, steady income, and oftentimes they are not able to recognize when it's happening to them. One out of five older adults experience financial exploitation with the average victim losing $120,000. Financial professionals are often the first to recognize the signs that a vulnerable or senior adult is being financially exploited. LB 297 closes the gap bringing financial institutions, broker dealers, financial advisors, law enforcement, and adult protective services together more uniformly to assist in combating one of the most intolerable and damaging crimes. LB 297 will protect the wealth, safety, and well-being of vulnerable adults in Nebraska. We congratulate the Nebraska legislature and the state of Nebraska for adding this valuable tool in the fight against financial exploitation. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Gina, Director Lammers, and of course, Sarah Lindstrom. And just like we had for the previous bill, I have signed copies for you here. And Senator Lindstrom, we're going to start with you since this was your bill. Congratulations on getting this passed. Right, Great you. job. Thank you very much. All right. Perfect. Thank Great. you. Thank Appreciate you, Senator. It. And Gina, we're going to go out of order. We're going to give you the next one. Sorry, Kelly, you're getting excited there. We get ladies first here. Come on. Thank you very much for your support of the bill, Gina. Congratulations. Great. Thank you. And now, Director Lammers, we will get you your copy. Thank you for all your help on passing this important bill as well. Congratulations. Thank you. All right. Great. Thank you very much, folks. Sarah, I know you've got to get back to vote as well, so I appreciate it. Gina, thank you for, for joining us. Director Lammers, thank you as well. All right. So, so again, some of our early successes here in the legislature with regard to getting important bills passed. So very exciting. All right. So uh, next, I want to talk uh, about the pandemic. And I want to remind people again that we are still in a pandemic, even with increasing vaccines that we're seeing coming into the state of Nebraska. So yesterday we saw that we had an increase of 14 hospitalizations in the state of Nebraska. We were at 102, and now we've gone up to 116. And while that number still represents less than 3% of all the hospital beds that we have available right now in the state of Nebraska, and our hospital capacity is still very robust, uh, at 34%, uh, right? Oh, you want to flip to that slide there? Click the next one. Oh, you don't have it up? Well, it's 34% of our hospital beds are available and 31% of our ICU beds are available. So while we still have robust hospital capacity, we do want to remind people, please continue to use the tools that we have to be able to slow the spread of the virus. That means keeping that six foot of distance between you and other people when you're out in public, wearing a mask when you go to the store, wash your hands often. If you've lost that sense of taste or smell, or have a fever or a cough, please stay home until you can get tested. It's important that we slow down the spread of the virus. Uh, we actually have tested now over a million people in the state of Nebraska and have administered over two and a half million tests statewide through all of our testing uh, venues. So we've made a tremendous amount of uh, progress there. And then uh, we also have Test Nebraska available. Again, this is burden-free, cost-free, you can sign up at testnebraska.com. We've tested uh, 730,000 people through testnebraska.com. So please, we have the means available to be able to get their testing. Over the last three weeks, we've seen an increase with regard to the number of uh, cases. And as we saw yesterday, we saw an increase in the number of hospitalizations. So we want people to, again, please use the tools that we've got out there to be able to slow the spread of the virus. Uh, also, with regard to the vaccines, we've now delivered over 868,000 vaccines in people's arms. This puts us uh, overall uh, fifth best in the nation with regard to uh, vaccinating vulnerable uh, Nebraskans. I think we're in the top three with regard to seniors, 65 years and older. We're 18th in the nation right now as far as the population that has been fully vaccinated at 18%. The CDC has us at number 12 uh, for uh, 
people who have been vaccinated per 100,000. And uh, I think the New York Times has a 21%, uh, number 21 for the uh, number of doses used at 80%. Uh, remind people that you can still sign up uh, to get vaccinated, vaccinate.ne.gov or at 1-833-998-2275. Also, I wanna go over the phases of the vaccine. So on March 22nd, uh, we announced the state was moving into the phase 2A where we were directing health departments to be able to prioritize with 90% of the vaccines those folks who were 65 years and older. We've also, since that time, and then with, uh, uh, or since that time, have gone to the groups 50 and 64 with 90% being dedicated to that age group plus the 10% going then to the folks, I'm sorry, that was March 27th, we went to that group, where we were going 50 to 64 plus the people who uh, have underlying health care conditions. Now, what we've seen is the federal vaccine program is going to folks who are 18 years and up, and that many of our health districts are also moving into that category beyond. So starting on Monday, April 5th, the entire state will be eligible to go to any age category, that's 16 and up for Pfizer, 18 and up for Moderna, uh, to be able to do that. Now. That doesn't mean in your health district they will be going to any age category because different health districts are still at different places. So, for example, here in Lancaster County, I believe we're at age 58 and up right now, uh, but in other health districts, they're ready to move on and go to younger populations. So we still will uh, be you know, dedicating vaccines to those folks who are in underlying health conditions, but starting on Monday, April 5th, the, the health departments uh, will be expanding that age category as they see fit within their given health department. So it's an, another important reason why people should be getting signed up on vaccinate.ne.gov uh, or going to uh, you know, call 818-333-998-2275 to get registered, you can get in line. Now this is what I did. I signed up on the website and uh, last week, Douglas County sent me an email letting me know that I would, could get scheduled for my vaccine, and I am now scheduled for 1.30 on Saturday at UNMC to get my vaccine, and so we will actually do a press availability Saturday at 1.30 when I'm getting my first shot of the vaccine. So uh, the system absolutely works. Got, got the email like I was supposed to, so uh, please sign up, and then you'll be invited to get your vaccine. Uh, you also can sign, you can also check with the different pharmacies that are eligible. So one of the other things that we found out from the White House this week on our weekly call is that the federal pharmacy program is going to be expanded from approximately 17,000 pharmacies nationwide to about 40,000 pharmacies nationwide, and that they will be distributing one or 5.1 million doses of Johnson and Johnson. So that's a significant increase for the federal pharmacy program. That's more than doubling the amount of vaccine that they had been distributing through those pharmacies. So you can check with your local pharmacy uh, for those times and get signed up to be able to get, just get scheduled with your pharmacy if they are part of that program, that federal retail pharmacy program. And next week, uh, so the way that works is that that opens up to be ordered starting tomorrow. And so you can expect that next week those pharmacies will start getting those additional doses of Johnson Johnson in. So that's another channel that you can get vaccinated through that federal pharmacy program. Uh, and again, we'll be opening that up to all age groups across the state. So please get signed up, vaccinate.ne.gov, or go to your pharmacy uh, to be able to get scheduled for that. So that's important. As also part of that uh, program, we also were informed uh, yesterday that the state will be receiving a large supply of Johnson & Johnson, 5.1 million vaccines as well. So that's on top of, well, not we, the sta our state of Nebraska won't, but states in general will be getting, states, tribes, and territories will be getting 5.1 million doses of Johnson & Johnson. So we expect, again, a, uh, a significant increase in the number of Johnson & Johnson vaccines available to the state of Nebraska on top of the Moderna and the Pfizer that we're getting as well. So again, we want people to get signed up. We want to get uh, these vaccines out into people's arms. This is how we really work our way through the pandemic is by getting people vaccinated so that they, uh, that we, they have the antibodies and the virus doesn't spread any further. And especially with our increase in hospitalizations, we want people to get vaccinated as quickly as possible. So a lot of news there on the, the, the vaccine front with regard to uh, increases in vaccines. 
Uh, the federal, uh, what the federal government did say yesterday on the White House call was that this increase of 5.1 million vaccines is not necessarily going to be every week. It'll fluctuate with regard to the Johnson & Johnson. But uh, obviously good news for us uh, as a nation to be able to get that 5.1 million through the states, tribes, and territories, as well as 5.1 million to the federal pharmacy, uh, retail pharmacy program. All right. Let's see. Uh, what else do we want to hit upon? I think those are the things that we wanted to hit. Again, I mentioned the upcoming schedule. Uh, Saturday, April 3rd, 1.30 p.m., we'll be doing a press availability when I receive my first shot of the vaccine. All right, so let's get into some of the questions and answers. Christian Wagner, NTV, what does the governor think of the proposed meat uh, packing plant for the city of North Platte? It sounds like it could bring jobs and businesses in town, but there have been a lot of people in town that have voiced concerns. Well, I fully support the business that is opening up to provide additional meat processing capacity here in the state of Nebraska. That's a good thing. More competition is always good. More facilities, more capability is always good for the state of Nebraska. We are the number one uh, red meat processing state in the country, and this will help us keep that title. So we want to continue to do that. Uh, with regard to the issues, I think you can see what's happened with regard to the facility from Lincoln Premium Poultry and Costco in, in Fremont, that there were concerns from people, but really those concerns have not materialized. That it's a great addition to the community. It's creating lots of great jobs. In, <clears throat> in the case of Fremont, it actually was one of the things that helped them with, for example, their uh, you know, cleaning up some of their water systems, the water treatment that was not in compliance. Um, uh, it's helped with regard to uh, just a general great corporate partner there that's been contributing to roads construction and so forth. So uh, I think that this is all good and North Platte will see the same sort of thing that uh, you're going to see a great corporate partner who's going to create jobs and really contribute to the overall well-being of the city of North Platte. So good news there. Henry Cordes, Omaha World Herald. Last week in your column, you criticized LB 147 in the legislature as a bailout for OPS. The bill sponsor said the measure language could not be more clear in stating that the funds $840 million uh, liability, that means OPS's pension liability, liabil or, you know, has a liability of $840 million. Those are short because of their mismanagement uh, by OPERS. Uh, they're short $840 million. Uh, would remain the responsibility of OPS. Why do you um, ag agree, or why do you disagree with that, and how, um, how is that, as you stated, a slippery slope? So what we at the state have done, because of the mismanagement of, of that fund, has taken over the investment management. Now with LB 147, what they're proposing is to take over more of the actual management, for example, sending out pension checks and so forth. So this is another step taking us closer to the overall responsibility. And while the bill does say that o OPS is still responsible for the pension liability, that's a statute that could be easily changed. This is why it's a slippery slope. We're taking more and more steps of going down the path of taking it over. And that's, it's irresponsible for the state of Nebraska to take over that pension liability. So that is why I oppose this bill, that as we get into more of the actual administration of that fund and start sending out, for example, pension checks, we are getting closer to taking on that liability despite what that bill says. That bill could be changed. That law, if it were to pass, could be changed down the road. It could be changed in the legislature. It is that slippery slope, which is why uh, I oppose uh, LB 147 for going down this path. We should not be exposing the state taxpayers for the mistakes that were made by the folks that we're managing that fund for the OPS teachers um, right there. That, that needs to be fixed by the folks in Omaha. Uh, Matt Oberding, Lincoln Journal Star. Uh, some health districts are offering vaccine to anyone 18 and older. Others are still focusing on 50 plus. Any chance of revisiting the vaccine allocation strategy to send more vaccines to districts where there appears to be more demand? And the answer is, Matt, we actually already dynamically manage that. So where we see that there's more demand in one health district versus another health district, we do uh, move those vaccines around to be able to do that. So we are actually are doing that already and we'll continue to do that as we see, for example, maybe more demand for uh, seniors in Lincoln or Omaha or more people we have to get to, we'll, we'll make sure that we're allocating those to be able to help balance that out. Paul Hamill, Omaha World Herald, please ask the governor to respond to concerns by corrections officers union that their pay is still too low compared to county jail officers. So first of all, we have taken a number of steps 
to be able to make sure that we're increasing the pay for our corrections officers. We've done that over you know, the, um, a number of years here to be able to increase that pay. And then we just negotiated a contract with our corrections officers through the FOP. The ink on that contract is barely dry. Uh, that contract just uh, began, well actually the contract just got signed in January and will begin July 1st. And so that, and that by the way, that that contract was approved by the union membership. And that pay increase for our corrections officers is double what a majority of our other teammates in state government are getting. So we, we continue to look for ways to be able to make sure we're attracting or training talent. Uh, we've looked at professional development as well as investing in additional security and equipment and training and so forth. Pay is one aspect of it, but as I mentioned, uh, the contract was just negotiated and signed by the Corrections Union. Uh, Ruta Olsenaida from KMTV. Is it a realistic timeline to assume that everyone that wants a vaccine and is eligible will be able to get it and will get one in seven to ten days? So I think that what uh, Ruta is really talking about is just uh, how we're moving through the progressions of ages, how we focus really on 65 and above, and then on Monday we'll really be opening that up to um, any age category. But with the caveat that, again, it depends on your local health district. So every health district is progressing at different levels. So, uh, again, we want to make sure that we're getting that vaccine out as quickly as possible and encourage people to get signed up. So that's why we're expanding the uh, age categories. As the vaccine effort uh, expands through uh, the federal retail pharmacy program, and now anyone 18 or old can sign up, is, um, can sign up is, uh, uh, is supply increasing to these pharmacies to meet demand? And again, I just uh, mentioned that uh, the federal retail pharmacy program will get 5.1 million doses of J&J &J nationally, which means we would expect to get our proportionate share of that here in Nebraska, which would more than double what we got from J&J &J through that program the previous week. So. So yes, so, the, so supply is, is expanding. Uh, thoughts on Nebraska residents from larger cities traveling, to, uh, traveling hours to rural Nebraska for a vaccine because appointments aren't filling up in those areas. Will less vaccine be allocated to these areas and more uh, to larger, more populated counties? So with regard to how the state is managing our allocation, we are going to be moving those allocations to areas of more demand. With regard to the retail pharmacy program, that is one that is again managed by the federal government, and so if those spots are available, somebody, you know, anybody's eligible to, to sign up for those spots, assuming um, that you find a, a pharmacy that has an allocation or has a, a schedule opening, and so uh, th those uh, allocations are determined by the federal government. We don't have any insight into how they're going to move those around to the various pharmacies. Okay, and then. Uh, Final question here, plans on getting vaccinated yourself? And as I just mentioned, I signed up like everybody else, uh, was uh, received an invitation when we moved to the 50-year-old group. Yes, I'm over 50. And so uh, uh, I got the invitation and signed up for Saturday, and then we'll do a press availability for that. So with that, we are, Taylor, do you have any questions that were texted in? So, uh, I'm sorry, who was that again? Ashley Channel 8. Ch Ashley Channel 8 is asking about the $2 trillion uh, infrastructure plan that the Biden administration has just unveiled that includes things such as uh, broadband and greener en energy and that sort of thing. I actually have not had a chance to review that package, so I, I can't address any of the specifics that are in that package. Though I will say that we introduced here in Nebraska uh, a program with Senator Friesen, who's chair of the Transportation and Telecommunication Committee, as well as Speaker Hilgers as a co-sponsor as a co-sponsor to invest $20 million in expanding broadband to 80,000 Nebraska households that don't have that 25 megabit download, 3 megabit upload speed. So we've proposed $20 million in each of the next two years of the biennium to reach about 30,000 of those households to be able to get that kind of basic level of broadband access. So fully aligned with the need to be able to make sure that we're offering broadband to all Nebraskans here in the state. And that's all I've got. All right, so here in the room, Fred. Governor, earlier this year, um, in arguing for your 3% property tax limit, you made the argument that if the state doesn't do something, there was a good possibility of an initiative campaign, and it would be better to have the state do something specific. That's exactly 
exactly the argument that Steve Wafer made yesterday after the Judiciary Committee advanced medical marijuana. Um, what is the difference? Well, I think the uh, difference between, so what Fred asked is that, you know, when I was talking about putting a, a 3% a limit on how fast property taxes could go up and versus, uh, and that it would be better for the legislature to do that rather than wait for a ballot initiative to uh, take it, you know, where the people take action themselves. Uh, and then what Senator Lathrop was arguing with regard to his um, marijuana bill was the same sort of thing, that the legislature should take action rather than leaving it to the ballot initiative. The difference is that marijuana is illegal. It's a drug that's illegal by the federal government. So that is something that's clearly a violation of federal law that he's proposing. Trying to provide property tax relief is what Nebraskans have been talking to me about for a long time. Well, you say marijuana is illegal, but... No, Fred, I didn't just say it. It is illegal. It's a, it's a legal drug. In Nebraska, it's illegal, and it's illegal federally. Yes, but a large number of other states have effectively legalized it for medical purposes. So other states have legalized it, supposedly for medical purposes, but there's no data to show that it actually works for any medical purposes. And we can see in those states like Colorado that have taken the step to not only legalize it for those, you know, quote unquote medical purposes, but now recreational purposes, which is frankly, medical has always been the first step in going to recreational. The devastating impacts that it's having on their children in Colorado. We can see that, for example, in 2012, there were 83 suicides by youth. These are young children who committed suicide with having a toxicology report. Tox, tox, help me out. Toxicology report, thank you, Dr. Antone, a toxicology report that they had marijuana in their system. After legalization, that jumped to 200. We've seen that the number of suicides that have marijuana in the toxicology report go up to 30% of the suicides, where alcohol is about 10%. So we can see the devastating impacts this is having. In fact, the Denver Post even editorialized on the need to have more restrictions and regulations. Uh, almost one in five high schools, well, it is about one in five, it's almost 21% of seniors, 12th graders, in Colorado is using marijuana or a THC product on a daily basis. And one of the things we know is that using marijuana or THC products at a young age actually destroys your cognitive ability, destroys your ability to think, brings your IQ down. These are medical, medically proven facts. This is a dangerous drug. And like all drugs, it should go through the FDA process, which is the process we have established to make sure the drugs are safe and effective for being used in a certain dose in a certain way, to actually have the scientific data. You know, when it comes to um, the science on this, the science is very clear that drugs should go through the FDA. Yeah, Martha. Well, actually, that bill is more expansive than that, Martha. I believe it actually would cover people who are here illegally to be able to do to uh, get those unemployment benefits. So that's why I was opposing that. Here in Nebraska, we actually have a statute that state benefits can't go to people who are here illegally, and that's why I'm opposing that. Yeah, Andrew. Yeah. Well, I think we need to continue to communicate out to folks uh, with regard to uh, getting the uh, information out there with regard to who's eligible. As we talked about today, on Monday, we're going to be able to opening it up to all age groups. Uh, but at each health department is going to manage it in a way that is most appropriate for their health department. So, for example, while uh, Lincoln and Omaha, and the, by the way, both Lincoln and Omaha are doing a very good job of getting, for example, seniors vaccinated. Uh, they're may they've got more seniors to do than maybe some of the other health district. And so other health districts are moving along a little bit more faster, a uh, little bit more quickly. So we just continue to educate people with regard to that. Uh, there's lots of information out there. We want people to get the vaccine. 
sign up, you know, every press conference I'm talking about, vaccinate.ne.gov or call the 833 number, the toll free 833 number to be able to get that vaccine. That's one way to do it. You can go to the retail pharmacy program, which was set up by the federal government. So that's a separate program that we were not a part of. Uh, they did not consult with us about getting that set up. That's the federal government's own program. But that's another channel to be able for people to get the vaccines. Well, uh, again, uh, I think I've, as I've said in these press briefings in the past, we would have appreciated and I think it would have been more effective if the federal government had actually worked with us before rolling out the retail pharmacy program because that's where people are signing up multiple sites. So, for example, the different pharmacies each have their own site to sign up at. Whereas if you'd signed up on vaccinate.ne.gov, you know, uh, that is, oper uh, you know, actually soon will be operational for everybody, but for example, uh, Douglas County gets the download from vaccinate.ne.gov, which is where I signed up, and that's how I got the invitation to go get my vaccine on Saturday. So that system is working seamlessly between, you know, for example, for the state allocations uh, versus what the federal retail pharmacy, which is where you have to go each of the different pharmacies by themselves. They did not coordinate with that with us. So I think it could have been more effective if the federal government had to coordinate with us on that retail pharmacy program to be able to make sure we had that. But again, they're trying to get vaccines out, and so are we. So we're just working with the system that's out there to get as many vaccines out as quickly as possible. Yeah, is it following? Or something, oh, is it same question, Andrew, or something else? It was something else. Okay, I'm gonna go Martha then. Yeah, Martha. So Martha is asking from the Omaha World Herald, again, I think you're referring to my column where I weighed in on uh, three different bills. Those were all bills I had weighed in on the past. So for example, it's been very clear that I oppose uh, uh, benefits to illegal immigrants. Um, the OPRS thing I talked about when, when we passed the bill last year or the two years ago, when we started doing investment advice, I'd been talking about how I did not want to see the state becoming liable for the pension problems from the Omaha public school system uh, and so forth. So those were all issues where I had weighed in before. And typically, again, when it's a new issue, I let the legislature have a chance to go through their process. I don't always wait till it gets to my desk, but generally I let the legislature have a chance to go through their process first. But in the case of uh, the three issues I talked about in my column, those were all things I'd weighed in on the past. Have you previously weighed in on the student journalism bill? Have I weighed in on the student journalism bill? I have not weighed in on the student, the student journalism bill. At this point, I'm going to let the legislature continue to work through their process. Andrew. Question for Dr. Antone. Uh, Andrew asked, uh, how concerned are we or how concerned is everybody about this maybe new surge or new uptick in cases that we're seeing? So, you know, we are seeing, as the governor mentioned, there was an increase uh, this past week in the number of cases, positive cases, that were, uh, you know, identified. And, you know, that's something that we're always keeping our eye on. We always have to balance that with how many people are getting tested because the more people that are getting tested, the more positive cases you're going to find. And that's what we did find this week is that we had an increase of about an extra 1,500 people getting tested and about an extra 50 people testing positive compared to the week before. So it's sort of hard to use that as a metric. You know, we've always used, as we've said, the hospitalization data to really find if there is a surge or not. It could be that some of these cases that are testing positive obviously are in the younger age group, not in that higher age group that you consider to need hospitalizations for or deaths. 
So that's what we're trying to manage. And then, you know, with the variants coming on board, that's another thing we're trying to keep track of to make sure that that's not the reason that we're seeing, you know, maybe a surge in cases or whatever. But as far as I talk to people, talk to other doctors, talk to other CMOs, and all, all our calls that we have, you know, it's something we're always concerned about. But I think it's great balance to have that vaccine come out now. So there's no doubt about it. If we can keep patients or people getting signed up for the vaccine, we can prevent this surge. And if we, or if there is a surge, and, it, and if we can keep people to be diligent about, keep wearing their mask in certain situations, following those non-pharmaceutical interventions, we can prevent it. We can do it. So we're getting close, but we still need to be cautious. Yeah. So Andrew asked how many of these new cases have been vaccinated. So we would, we would call that a, a vaccine breakthrough. So a patient is defined as being fully vaccinated if they test positive 14 days after being fully vaccinated. So we can't confirm this, but we have about maybe 15 positive cases here in Nebraska where that has taken place. Sure, so uh, there's uh, such a thing as called a vaccine breakthrough. So a vaccine breakthrough would be somebody that's defined as fully vaccinated, which means they've been either received the two doses of Moderna or Pfizer and have waited 14 days after that, or the one dose of Johnson & Johnson and 14 days after that, then test positive. So we have identified, not confirmed, but identified about 15 of those cases here in Nebraska. It's to be expected. I mean, the vaccines are not 100% effective against, you know, getting infected by the virus. Obviously, we've heard the numbers from Moderna and Pfizer being in the mid 90% range, so it's not 100%, and J&J &J being in the 70% range, 77% range here in the United States. So they're not 100% infected, effective as far as getting infected. It's a small fraction of one. I think the governor calculated it yesterday and it was like l less than one tenth of one percent. So, and do you know how severe these cases are? Is it doing the, top, the bottom line? Is that vaccine doing what it's supposed to do? So, Andrew asked, is, is the bottom line is are these patients either going to the hospital or dying? And we're working on that information right now, but to our knowledge, we do not know of any. Thank you, Dr. Anto. Other questions? Yes, Andrew. Go ahead. So the question was, uh, what about uh, the, the Horse Racing Commission meeting and what kind of guidelines need to be established with regard to um, establishing future racetracks. Andrew, I don't know what the process is for that right offhand. I suspect it's mostly a local zoning issue, but without having dug into it, I can't give you an answer on that right now. We'd have to find out what the current process is and see if there's any opportunities for improvement. How much of a concern do you have that, that um, you could have, you know, people putting up racetracks all over the state, you know, and putting them, putting casinos in? So the question was, well, do I have a concern that people could be putting up racetracks all over the state and then uh, putting up casinos within those racetracks? And this is actually one of the things I warned about when I was talking about my opposition to expanding gambling here in the state, that if you went down this path, you were gonna start seeing that you could have casinos anywhere in the state. And so, yes, I am concerned that we're gonna see more casino gambling across the state. One or two more questions. All right, seeing none, we'll go ahead and wrap up. But again, folks, thank you very much for joining us. Again, with the increasing hospitalizations we saw yesterday, uh, there was just a one-day increase, but that does cause for concern. So please, continue to practice all the tools that we've given you to slow the spread of the virus. Wash your hands often. Wear a mask when you go to the store. If you've got the, the symptoms of lost tense of taste or smell or have a cough or fever, stay home until you can get tested to find out for sure whether or not you've got 
coronavirus. We don't want you spreading it in the community. Keep that six foot of distance between you and other people in public. Avoid the three C's. Oh, well, that's not out there. That's not that one. Uh, avoid the three C's. You know, those crowded places, confined spaces, close contact. This is how the virus spreads. So even though we're making great progress in getting people vaccinated, and we want people to continue to get vaccinated, we're seeing more vaccine coming into the state, please take the steps. It's a great time to be optimistic, but also a great time to continue to be cautious. Thank you all very much. And again, it's 1.30 Saturday. I'll be getting my vaccine, and so we'll have a media availability for that as well. Everybody have a great rest of your week.